Okay, let's talk a bit more about motion capture in general. And I'm going to start with a focus on 2D in this presentation, then probably do a 3D uh, presentation uh, separate. Okay, let me share my screen. This is a lecture I would use in KIN 743 instrumentation. Let's go through it and I'll try to expand on, on uh, some of this. If it starts, there we go. All right. Hopefully that is working. It's hard to tell on uh, Zoom here. All right. So the history of kinematics dates back even to early 1900s. Edward James Moybridge. Boy, uh, back in uh, 1830 to 1904. And one of the famous stories is this one here where there's an argument about whether or not a horse uh, would be running and uh, whether or not the, the hooves of the, of the horse are off the ground entirely. Now, they obviously did not have motion capture back then, but they did have still cameras. And so what uh, they set up was a situation where the horse would run along a runway and the hooves would break a string that would uh, be connected to an individual camera and that uh, string would pull on the camera in a way that it would take a picture. So in this uh, example here, there's what, 12 pictures? That means they had 12 cameras uh, to be able to get this. And they were able to find uh, the images where the horse uh, was fully in, in the air. And therefore one person won the bet and the other didn't, I don't know. I don't know who won, who didn't. So uh, anyway, so that was the, uh, the really the, the early stages of motion capture. Now an individual picture obviously is not motion, but uh, that's what uh, the concept that we're going to be um, following up on is just this. And in essence, the videos that we watch uh, are nothing more than a series of still pictures. And, and you know that there, you have frame by frame advancement and, uh, and, uh, and you see the individual pictures that it played back at the right speed, all those pictures look like they happen uh, continuously and there's movement. And so here's just uh, another example of um, some uh, images, still images taken that if you uh, ran your eye past these fast enough or if you put them in some sort of device uh, that would, would move these images along, you'd actually would see this person doing these types of movements. So this is an early stage of uh, some kinematics. And here's just uh, an example of an early um, imaging capture device. It looks a lot like a shotgun but obviously in the, that uh, upper barrel would be film and that would rotate so that uh, at a certain speed and each time it rotated uh, a new picture would be taken. All right, so that's taking individual pictures. Now the other image that I have here is what's called strobox, using a strobe light, where this is one image, okay? And a strobe light, a flashing light is going off. And each time that light flashes, a part of that image, uh, or in this case, the person walking, shows up on that film plate. So in this case, this is a single film plate, but those Im individual images are simply because of the way the strobe light is working. And what was neat about this technique is uh, back then they, they had strobe lights that could work at a pretty high rate. And so you could actually get some pretty granular detail in terms of motion capture using a strobe light uh, example. The problem is, is that uh, the room has to be really dark in between, um, in, in between the, the light flashes. So it's a little awkward uh, to try to figure out which movements you can do with a strobe light on. And if you've ever been in a room where there's a strobe light and only a strobe light going off, you know that that can be a little irritating as well. All right. Now, uh, as I said, our, our techniques that we uh, take are 
motion capture data, the film, the video, uh, or digital images is, uh, is nothing more than uh, digitizing our, um, our film record, all right? Uh, and so it's, it's similar to analog to digital uh, type of process. But I don't wanna lose sight that when we start doing, talking about auto digitizing, using a, a, a system like Vicon that we have, uh, that auto digitizer is actually doing exactly what we did in the old days by hand. And by hand, what we would do is we would have these images, there's one, two, three, four in that sequence, and we would track a marker or maybe two markers, whatever it is. And we would know that how fast the images were being recorded. In this case, 15 Hertz. Remember Hertz is anything over seconds. So this is 15 frames per second. And um, what we would know is, you know, if we know how many frames there were between time one and time two, we could then figure out the time between these two frames and this frame and this frame. So then we could go down this list and we could take frame one, frame two, frame three, and frame four, if these are the consecutive frames, we could mark down these times, this would be time zero, this would be one fifteenth of a second later, two fifteenths of a second from the beginning, three fifteenths and so forth. We'd be incrementing by one fifteenth of a second. Then we could go in and identify where this marker is in space relative to a horizontal and a vertical reference frame. So we'd have to create some type of reference frame in this uh, field of view. So if I make this corner right here, zero, zero, then I can measure my X dimension of that marker and I can measure my Y dimension of that marker. Maybe I can do a pen. So I can come over here Oops, that's not very good. And then go up and that's my X dimension. And then I go up on my Y axis and then I come over here to my marker and I get my X, Y coordinates for this marker. And I go and write them in here, my X and my Y. Then I go to my next frame and I do it again. I find the coordinates for that frame and the next frame and the next frame. So uh, your auto digitizer is doing the same thing. It's just making the decision for you. So for example, I put that marker right there and uh, I did, you know, that marker is partially covered by this person's arm, but I'm using my eye to know where that marker mostly was uh, relative to his arm hiding some of that marker. Those are the types of decisions that when you use an auto digitizer, a computer, al computer algorithm is making for you. So sometimes hand digitizing is actually quite valuable uh, when we're doing uh, this type of work. And then we do need it with, uh, we do need a conversion factor where this image obviously is small and, uh, but what this is telling us is that there is one meter for every 2.4 centimeters if this was printed up. Okay, not on this scale here. Well, maybe it is 2.4, but yeah. Uh, but that is um, a conversion factor to real units from screen units. All right, now um, all different applications, you know, I'm sitting here talking about digitizing for research purposes. But obviously, um, there, this is used a lot in um, the movie industry. Uh, here are some digitizing techniques uh, applied and then using the XYZ coordinates in this case to generate uh, characters or gaming, okay? And gaming is another big industry where uh, gaming um, uh, companies have motion capture studios create uh, images or create uh, characters off of movements that actors come in and, uh, and do and are recorded. All right, so instrument options when you're doing motion capture is 2D, 3D, passive marker, active marker, and markerless systems for optical systems. This is using some type of camera, but then there's also non-optical systems 
And that's where we start talking about inertial measuring units and even an electrogoniometer would fall in this category. IMUs in general have become more popular. I don't have uh, information on the IMUs in this uh, presentation. We'll come back and talk about that in a separate presentation. But the optical systems are very common in uh, labs. Passive markers means um, someone who is having a marker placed on them and that marker is reflecting light back to a camera, okay? An active marker is a marker placed on a person where it's actively shining a light. And so this is a little different. We don't have this in our lab, but this would be, for example, uh, using an LED light on um, the knee, for example. And that LED is uh, transmitted and picked up by a camera that, uh, that tracks that, uh, that looks for that LED specifically, that wavelength even. All right. But in general, our system uh, and, and a lot of the systems out there are passive marker, meaning that they're reflecting light and the cameras are picking up uh, that reflection. Uh, markerless uh, hardware is a little different, in that, but that this is becoming more common. This would be something like your uh, Kinect system or your Wii system, your gaming system, where there is a, a camera system that is basically doing image processing uh, while you're standing in front of it. And that's uh, the way that you're able to uh, hold, you know, hold a couple devices and then do some movements and the Connect system will track those movements and then interpret those relative to uh, whatever game is being played. This is also comes into play with facial recognition, even body recognition uh, uh, type of uh, of hardware and, and uh, the algorithms are pretty sophisticated to be able to uh, pull this out because it's all about image processing and then uh, figuring out how the image is changing uh, and, and then interpreting that change as some type of movement. All right, so again, that's a gaming type of system for most, but there are some uh, research labs that use those uh, for uh, research questions as well. Let's talk a little bit about the camera or the recording device in motion capture. Uh, the camera has a lens um, and it has a sensor in essence. Uh, back in the day, the sensor would be film, all right? And that's a nice classic picture of, a, uh, of, a, of an old camera where the film would be installed in that uh, backside of that camera. More uh, uh, common uh, right now is our cameras have what's called a charge couple device. It's a, it's a digital film plate, that's what it is. And in a previous presentation, I showed you a camera and uh, when you are not taking the picture, the light comes in the lens, this is a side view of the camera, bounces off this mirror and up into another series of mirrors and then comes out the viewfinder. So that way, what I'm looking at here is really this uh, ray of light right here. So I'm going to see in my viewfinder exactly what's going to end up on the uh, recording media or the charge couple device. When I push take a picture, this mirror flips up and the light then just goes directly to the charge couple device. Now, back in the day, uh, I don't know if this one has it. This, this may be a little bit of the viewfinder here, if I'm looking at that correctly. Um, the viewfinder was not always set up where you would have a problem or that you would be viewing a different ray of light uh, up here if you did not have this uh, mirror system. And that can lead to some obvious errors in terms of placement of a camera um, and, and what you see is not what you're actually going to record. But that's how a camera works. And the, uh, this mirror flips up and the camera system is set so that that mirror is flipped up for a specific period of time. And that's what we're, we'll, we'll talk about that in just a bit uh, where we talk about shutter speed. All right, a little bit more on lenses. Now I did some uh, uh, other videos on uh, lens and this is just more detail on that. Now the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Refraction is the bending of light as it passes through one media uh, to another. For lens, we're talking about um, the media being glass. And here we have a, a convex 
lens, and this is a concave lens. Concave, this looks like a cave. That's the easiest way to remember that. And this would be convex. This is also known as a converging lens. And what we have here are these red lines that represent rays of light off of some object that's off to the left here. And those rays of light come into the lens and due to refraction, it ends up changing the direction it's headed and it heads down in this direction. And a convex lens is set up in a way that those rays of light uh, to the left of the lens into the lens and then uh, converge to a single point. And we call that single point the fo focal point. We can measure how far that focal point is from the center axis of the lens. And we call that the focal length of the lens. Okay, so focal point is the point where all the rays of light are refracted and uh, all intersect on the right side of the lens. Uh, on the left side of the lens, we just think of these parallel rays of light coming in. This is conceptual at this stage. And then the focal length is how far that focal point is from the axis, long axis of the lens. And there's actually um, a couple of refractions going on here, refracting and then refracting again. But the lens, a convex lens will converge the rays of light to a single focal point. Convex lens actually does the same thing, but just a little different. This is a, diver a diverging lens or a diverging lens. So the rays of light come in and the way that this lens is shaped, they actually exit going off in different directions. If you project the, um, those rays of light back to the left, here's your focal point right here, okay? And here's your focal length. The distance that focal point is from the long axis of uh, the lens, All right? So both, uh, uh, convex and, and concave lenses have focal points and have focal lengths. Uh, they just end up being on different sides. Now in a camera lens, it's very common to use um, a you know, series of lens, uh, combination of both uh, uh, converging and diverging lenses in order to uh, treat the light in a way that it ends up in the right spot, either for projecting or for um, or recording uh, uh, the, the light onto some media. So focal point, focal length, and radius of curvature is just describing the lens here and how much curvature and therefore how much refraction there may be because as it passes, as light passes through the lens, it's going to refract in entering lens and it's going to refract exiting lens. Okay, the camera. All right, so the the, uh, the object placed some distance from uh, S, S1 from lens and focus at S2. All right, so here's, the, here's just an easy way to look at this. Here's the object. And if we take these rays of light coming off this point of the object, we have rays of light, they're going off in all different directions, okay? This ray of light is going this way. It's refracting going through this uh, converging lens. And then it is um, uh, projected uh, over here. Uh, and then these rays of light are uh, refracted in other ways. Well, this, this ray of light is passing straight through the lens just the way that it's, in, it's uh, entering and exiting uh, the lens and the angle that it does that. But ultimately we get an image on one side of the, um, of the lens. Uh, now, what's not illustrated here is the focal length. The focal length is where all those parallel rays of light come uh, to focus. So that, fo let me try it. That would be right here, okay? This is the focal point. This is the focal length, okay? This is where the image shows up. And what we would need to do is ultimately put our film right here or recording media right here to be able to record that image such that all of the lights are refocused at this point and I'm able to uh, record a focused image. If I put my film here, or if I put my film here, the rays of light are not going to be 
uh, in uh, the, the representing the same point. So they're they're out of focus here, and they would be out of focus here. So on the lens, we talk about the focus ring. The focus ring is simply moving, in essence, where that image is falling relative to the film plane. It's not changing the lens. The focus ring is lens is not focus ring is not changing the focal length of uh, the lens. It's simply changing where the media is going to fall relative to uh, the projected image. Uh, yeah, so it's in focus as S2, and there's just some math behind it. As focal length gets smaller, S2 gets smaller. Uh, as focal length increases, S2 gets larger. So that's just talking about where the image is going to fall relative to the focal length of the lens. Remember, this is the focal length right here, really, is what we've been talking about, where that, that distance, this focal point is from this axis. If I have a lens that has a longer focal length, all right, that's going to be a longer line over here, and, uh, and that image is going to get larger because now these rays of light will continue to travel and ultimately I'm going to get a bigger image if I have a, a, a lens that has a longer focal length. Okay, If I have a shorter focal length, this focal point is closer and the image will actually get smaller uh, as um, I use a, a lens with a smaller focal length. All right, let's look at this picture here. Longer focal length, bigger image. Here's our uh, mountain. And we're just taking, in this cartoon, three different uh, points for rays of light coming off. They pass through the lens. They are refracted in different ways. And the image shows up here, inverted, uh, it, uh, on the focal plane. If there's a, a lens that has a shorter focal length, meaning that the focal point, this would be the focal point here, the focal point is closer to the axis of the lens, the image ends up being smaller simply because the rays of light, the image in focus is smaller because the rays of light are uh, not being refracted uh, in a way that um, would expand out the, the image. Okay, so focal length influences the, um, the size of the image that ultimately hits the film plane. And if you look at this length here, you'll see this is longer and that's why our zoom lenses are longer, okay? And our uh, wide angle lenses are much shorter, physically shorter. Now remember, your lens or a lens will have a series of lenses. It's not just one. You actually may have a diverging one and a converging one and so forth, ultimately to maybe influence the length, the, the physical length of, of the lens itself. All right, a little bit more on focal length. I've mentioned this uh, before in another presentation. Each color here represents a different lens. And each lens, each color has a different focal length. This one's 14 millimeters, 20 millimeters, 24 millimeters, 70, all the way up to 600 millimeters. What happens when we have a longer focal length is the width of the image that you can see gets smaller or conversely, as you go to um, a smaller uh, focal length, the image, I should have done it the other way, the image gets, um, uh, you, you actually get a wider field of view, right? You should have been wider than those. Um, but you get a bigger uh, field of view as the focal length gets smaller. Yeah, I just noticed this, this isn't as good of an image. This, this should have been wider uh, than those others. Uh, and so here's uh, just a, a series of pictures of the same object, but using different lenses. Wide field of view, a little narrower, a little narrower, a little narrower. And you can even see where this building is right here, okay? Okay, there's that building there, there's that building there. Here's that you see it's moving closer to the edge and it's moving closer to the edge because that, that width of field of view is getting smaller because the focal length is getting longer. Again, that's why this picture doesn't illustrate this as well. Here's that same building, oh, the building's almost off and now it's off. 
but now we can see these uh, towers. We can see a little bit more detail of that building, even more detail of the building. The, we're getting closer. Now we're really just zoomed in on this part here, and now we're really zoomed in using a 600 millimeter focal length lens. So with the camera in the same physical spot taking the picture, but because the different lenses are being used, you're seeing a different width of field, and you're also seeing a different size image uh, wow, on the, uh, the recording media. Uh, human eye is right around um, a focal length of 50 millimeters. So this is what, if you were standing, this is probably your uh, field of view uh, that you would see, something along that lines. And this is a standard lens that comes with a digital camera, is a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, these are just some different lenses. Uh, I've got another video that um, that illustrates or, or talks a little bit more about the different lenses. This is obviously longer focal length, shorter focal length. And this is 70, 200, 70 to 200 because the focal length can change. So uh, this one, again, focal length can change, but these are fixed. This one's a fixed and this one's a fixed focal length. All right, a little bit on the camera and uh, focusing the image. <clears throat> the focus ring make sure, makes sure that the image falls on the film or the recorded media in the right spot where the image is actually in focus. All right, so here's the pencil here. Here's the rays of light coming through. And uh, if I don't like how that this picture is done uh, because it's trying to illustrate, it almost seems like this is the focal point. But if you put the image um, if you have the lens too close to the film, the uh, rays will not uh, be organized in a way that the image is clear because all these rays are, um, are not representing uh, the, the original image. It's only when the film is a certain distance from the lens where the image comes into uh, focus and all the rays uh, from that point end up uh, converging in a way that that um, the image is clear. And same thing if you move the film out of uh, out of the plane um, from or, or a different distance from the uh, the lens, then your your image is going to be out of focus there as well because all these rays of lights are are no longer converging to the to the right point. All right. So uh, and this is just a different. Um, illustration that that's in focus, that's out of focus. You can see how the image plate is off uh, that point. And um, now we're, our image plate again is off that point there. And they are illustrating this as the focal point. All right. And they're putting the focal point on that lens um, because these are parallel rays of light. And it, the focus ring is not changing the focal length of the lens, it's changing where the image is falling. So we would either be moving the film or we're moving the lens in a way that physically this focal length, which is fixed, it's the same distance, but it's moving either forward or backwards uh, relative to the uh, film plate. Okay, the other important part of the lens, I, I shouldn't have put camera here, this should be lens, all right. Lens is the f-stop. Now, some cameras do control the f-stop, uh, but really this is a characteristic of, of the lens more so than the camera. The f-stop tells us how big of an aperture uh, is uh, in the lens, how much light is allowed to come into the lens. So this is looking straight down the barrel of a, of a lens and this has lots of light letting in, less light and even less light. That size of that uh, opening is described as the F stop or aperture size. And uh, your lens will have numbers like 1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, whatever. The size of this is actually the inverse of this number. And you can see how this is now written as a fraction with F as a numerator and 1.4 as the denominator. This F actually represents the focal length. So in essence, this ratio is telling you how much light is being let in for a given focal length. 
you know, if I have a focal length, I'll do it over here because um, it's math is easier. If I have a focal length of 80 millimeters, if I have the aperture on two, then the amount of light would be 80 divided by two or 40, um, 40 I'll just say units of light let in. Uh, whereas this aperture of four would be 20. So less light, more light. And in essence, it's related, and you can do the math where you can get the diameter of the, um, of the aperture based upon focal length and the aperture setting. All right, why is the amount of light let in important? Well, there's a couple things going on. Uh, oh, may, hopefully I have it later. If not, I'll come back and do it, um, do it again. Uh, but this, um, this tells us, there's a couple things that are going on. It, um, one, it restricts which light beams are allowed to come in the lens. And a, uh, a smaller aperture actually will increase the depth of field that's, being, that's in focus. I'm pretty sure I've got a picture for that. But it also uh, uh, makes the camera operate at the thickest part of the lens. Why is that important? Well, if you're gonna have any imperfections on the lens, they're often going to occur or they're gonna have the biggest impact where the lens is thinnest. So in that case, that would be on the edges of a con, uh, convex lens or a converging lens. So using uh, a small aperture actually reduces the amount of uh, error that you may see in your, um, in your recording uh, because you're working in a thicker part of the lens. Okay, so I, I switched over to shutter speed. This is a camera characteristic. This is telling us how, um, how long that mirror is being lifted up or how long the film is being exposed to light. If you have a long uh, exposure, these are cars driving away from you. All right, so this is, these are the red taillights and it looks like a continuous flow. And then these are the lights coming toward you. Huh, I guess this is uh, from some international picture. Um, so that's a long exposure. Right? Uh, the shorter the exposure, the more detail you can get on uh, uh, movement. Um, because, uh, well, here, here's the exposure of one second. This is water falling on these objects. This is one sixtieth of a second. And now you can see well, it's just a little bit of movement there. And then you go to one one thousandth of a second and really no movement. Why is that important? Well, let's say you're gonna digitize this. Well, I can clearly digitize this point at this moment in time. If I come over to this image, I've got, well, I've got this whole series of points that I get to choose one from. If I go to this one, I can't even, I can't even digitize this because it's all blurred uh, because the, the object was moving throughout the entire time the shutter was opened, and this is all being recorded on one uh, frame. So having a high um, or a, a high speed, uh, a short shutter uh, time will actually allow you to get more detail uh, to be able to digitize. This is why when we talk about uh, cameras um, even being the speed of the camera, we often refer to how fast the, the images are being recorded because that goes along with a shutter speed. Because if you're recording at one 200, uh, or it's gonna be 200 hertz, 200 frames per second, your shutter has to be open for something less than that. And so the faster your frame rate, the faster your shutter speed as well. I mean, this is just another set of slow shutter speed, everything's blurred, medium and fast. It looks like a, a still image at that point. And this is just showing, um, you know, in one quarter of a second, how far that blade is rotating, one thirty of a second, just that little bit, and one five hundredth of a second, not much at all. So shutter speed is important and it's ultimately going to be related to frame rate. And in order to have a high frame rate, you need to, be able to have a high shutter speed. Those are two different things, uh, but uh, both are both are important in terms of the level of detail you get on the image. Okay, uh, 
what do I got here? Uh, shutter speed, focal length, both influence the amount of light entering the camera. Uh, yeah, so this is just combining two concepts. The uh, width of field is going to be influenced by uh, the focal length of the camera. Uh, and the shutter speed is also influencing how much light will be coming in for any one image. And so again, just another, there's one five hundredths of a second. That's a darker image because less light was let in. One fifteenth of a second, more light let in uh, a much lighter uh, picture. All right, so here's my image on depth of field. This is what I was talking about earlier in this presentation. The depth of field is going to be influenced by the aperture, aperture uh, size. The smaller the aperture, the more depth of, of field. All right, so nicely illustrated here with these bottles. These two bottles are in focus. This one's sort of in focus, maybe a little bit, and these clearly are not in focus all the way out here. That um, how many of these bottles or how deep this focus ring goes uh, is the depth of field. So this is for uh, f rate f stop of uh, 1.8. That size of aperture. The bigger the aperture, the smaller the depth of field. Here's another example. This is 2.8 aperture size, so 1 over 2.8, that's uh, big. This hat's in focus, but if I change the same lens, I go to an f-stop of 16 or uh, f over 16. And again, this is common to write it as f16, f-16, f slash 16. Any of those are, are, are common to see. You can see more hats are in focus, OK? The depth of field is greater when the aperture is smaller. The depth of field is worse or smaller when the aperture is bigger. More light is let in here, less light is let in here. So if I want to have a, a, a big depth of field, I use a, a larger f-stop, a smaller aperture, and I need a lot more light. If I, uh, uh, if I don't need a big depth of field, I can have a large uh, aperture, a smaller f-stop, and less light because more light is going to enter uh, the lens. A little bit more on depth of field. Here's just another cartoon of this. So uh, big aper aperture, small aperture, light let in, lots of light, very little light, uh, depth of field, very little depth of field, lots of depth of field. So and this just uh, this person's in focus for this aperture setting. These three people are in focus for that. And all of these people are in focus for that aperture setting. Uh, same thing here. So again, depth of field uh, dependent on your uh, aperture range. Um, and I always like to think wherever I'm focused on, I'm looking at um, you know half of this is going to be in focus in front, and half is going to be in focused in back of that focal point. Okay, which would represent how what point I'm distant, I'm focusing on uh, uh, when I'm taking a picture. All right, so why, uh, what's going on? Well, it all has to do with rays of light passing through a lens and then converging to a point which we could then focus in on and that image is reproduced uh, 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 on the other side of the lens. Uh, actually, this one's going the other way. So this is the image here and here is our focal point here. And if we put our film right here is what we talked about before, this is, um, this is gonna be out of focus. And this is actually a sphere in here uh, because this, this is three dimensions, not two dimensions, but this is this circle, which I would bisect that circle for this discussion, would be a circle of confusion meaning the rays of light are not lined up and uh, are not um, uh, able to uh, be to be in focus in that uh, region. All right, so here, um, this is just a way to explain um, depth of field as well. What you're going to do is actually reduce the circle of confusion based upon how uh, much light is being allowed in the lens. And this isn't a great picture because what I would do in a aperture, 
I would reduce the light coming into this lens and I would only see the light rays coming into that portion of the lens. All of these rays of light are no longer uh, going to be uh, showing up on the image. And then I would have a, um, a greater depth of field because I'm dealing with less uh, extraneous uh, rays of light. Okay, some other errors uh, besides focus on um, uh, motion capture is uh, parallax and perspective. And I'll tell you that it's very common to use these to mean the same thing. And it gets a little confusing, uh, but parallax is displacement uh, position is different based upon line of sight. So this would be an example of parallax where I'm looking at an angle uh, to uh, these runners. Movement is out of the plane of motion relative to a camera axis. Perspective error, uh, the apparent change in um, object size is uh, based upon uh, the, where the object is relative to the plane uh, of motion, or in this case, the calibrated space that we're looking at. And so here the person looks smaller. I measured this person here, that's how big they are. Here the person is bigger. That's because they're closer to uh, the lens. And again, these are often used to mean the same thing. And I've found references in the camera industry as well as in biomechanics uh, industry where they have switched these um, uh, uh, parameters. So I collectively just call them parallax and perspective errors uh, because this can be considered a perspective error uh, because now this person is uh, in, you're in a different perspective than this person, uh, given this setup. Uh, okay, so, um, and here's a good example where this comes into play as well, especially if we have rotation. This is a uh, setup with um, uh, this system set up at 90 degrees. Um, I can move it forward. Okay, this, this um, tripod is more forward than this one. I still get 90 degrees as long as I am in the same plane of motion. But if I rotate the second one here, okay, but keep it in the same plane, I actually get a different angle. Other that's not going to be, that's not going to show up as 90 degrees when I do my 2D digitizing. Again, we're talking 2D right now, not 3D. Uh, so if I get a rotation out of the plane of motion, that can introduce angular errors and my uh, objects will also uh, uh, change length as well. So we want to, you know, when we're doing 2D, we really uh, try to analyze only movements that are in a particular plane, running, landing, things like that. 3D movements, you know, like throwing or kicking, uh, those are a little bit harder to analyze with 2D because you have rotation, any of movement in and out of uh, planes of motion. But that's why 3D uh, motion capture has become really common. Now, <clears throat> you probably see a lot of uh, neat graphics on TV from uh, camera systems. That is a multiple camera system. And the advantage that these systems have is they have known distances in the field of view. They know how far these hash marks are. They know the dimensions of the field uh, and they know where the cameras are placed. And so they can create some really neat graphics like a first down marker, or they can trace someone uh, as they went along and figure out how far they ran. So it's really pretty sophisticated what they're doing, uh, and it, but it is using multiple cameras, not just a, uh, a singular camera, but you can do some of this with a singular camera because you have a known um, dimension in the uh, field of view and you can work with them. And uh, when sport vision, what they also do is they uh, record the pan, the tilt, the zoom and the focus that's going on with each camera in order to create uh, those uh, special effects on the, on the field. Okay, well, oh, that was long. Um, lens anatomy, f-stop, focal length, focus ring, lens issues, depth of field, parallax, perspective. I guess I could have added focus in here too. And then uh, camera, charge coupled device or recording media and shutter speed. Okay, I think that is it.
That was a little longer. All right. Thanks for watching.